so good to see you. Do you know you look good? Just say, I know. Just say it. Just receive it. I know. Yeah, all right. Now I'll say it again and you just say, I know. Do you know you look good? All right, good. That's good for you today. All right, it's good. Guys, so, so happy to be here with you today, worshiping God and just allowing his presence and his word to transform us and to change us. Uh, before we get to the message, though, I, I just have a couple announcements. One, um, we have just a few small groups that are left to be filled for our small group launch. And you can do that when you go out in the atrium. We really believe that God didn't call you to live life alone. When he saved you, he brought you into his family. And he wants to put people in your life and he wants to put you in people's lives to walk the journey alone. And last year proved that we need people in our lives when things go a little crazy, doesn't it? So you can do that when you head out there also. If you want to stay around after this service, we're going to be baptizing 22 people right after service. Come on, that's awesome. So great. Really, really excited about that. So we'll do that right after service and celebrate all that God's doing in their lives. Guys, today we are continuing with the Sermon on the Mount. But I found out that one of my mentors, he was the president of the Bible college that Cheryl and I went to. He taught Life of Christ, Roman Galatians, homiletics, and probably everything else. As he also was the president, he was teaching and leading from a school down in San Antonio called International Bible College. And my wife and I went there for four years. But the speaker today had an incredible impact on my life. Not just from information. I was sharing with him the other day. Not just the information, but the, the, the heart and the passion and the sensitivity and the love for Jesus that I saw in his life. And I remember sitting in class and he'd be teaching on the life of Christ. Or teaching actually at points of the Sermon on the Mount. And he'd be overcome with emotion of the goodness of God or the emotion of God's heart to reach the world. And he walked that out and demonstrated it. He, he and his wife, Jeannie, have been in ministry for 53 years. I believe they've been married 53 years. Maybe it's been a little longer. Come on, 53 years? That's awesome. But he now pastors a church down in San Antonio, great church. As a matter of fact, he, when he started the church, I, he must have been going a little crazy. He asked me to be his first youth pastor. So Lord knows uh, he's, uh, he's a man of faith, you know, because he, he, he took us a risk. Um, but anyway, he's going to be sharing the word with us today. And I just want you to open your heart to him. I'm telling you, God's hand is on this man. He's ministered in 40 different nations. God's used him to bring deliverance to multiple, multiple people who were bound up in demonic powers and spirits. But he's, he's, he's an evangelist at heart. They travel the first 16 years of their marriage preaching around the world and in different ministries and different churches. And, and they are, they're the real deal. And you don't get to find very many real deals anymore. And so can we just welcome Pastor David Cook to the stage, please. We love you. God bless you. Thank you, Jason. Love you, man. Bless you all. It's great to be in Denver. Incidentally, Lana Fraze was the one that introduced me and Jeannie. And, uh, yeah. And, of course, uh, I met Russ in 1960, no, 1970 or 71. He was at Purdue University, and it just really, he had just been jettisoned into the kingdom of God. And Lana didn't know she married a preacher. I told Jeannie, I said, I don't think she knows what she's got. But uh, Russ was a great friend, great man of God, and we we were here Thursday night in that celebration of life. And, uh, but uh, Lana's the one that, kind of got us together, in fact, s- sang at our wedding, and, and, uh, and then she was married the next year. But we're so thrilled to be able to be here. Thank you, Brother Jason, for letting me share with this beautiful group of people, and it's just good to be in Denver. Uh, Brother Jason took us up to, where was it, Golden. My lands went to, the, went to heaven yesterday. And took a breath of this fresh. You know, it's been 80 degrees in San Antonio. I'm telling you what, it, it, it's, it's, it's really been warm. And we flew in here, and I said, my lands, 
But uh, y'all don't know it, but you live in one of the most beautiful places in North America. Maybe in the world. So, wonderful opportunity to share with you this morning. And what an exciting study that you're involved in. And I know that Brother Jason is uh, sharing with you this tremendous truth. The Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher that ever lived, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a, yeah, hey, he is the teacher. I'm going to share with you this morning what Jesus taught about worry, how to win over worry. In Matthew chapter 5, 6 and 7, you have this expanded teaching of Jesus. Now Luke condenses the Sermon on the Mount to about 20 some verses in the 6th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, but, but Matthew, he gives us the expanded, uh, not the Reader's Digest edition, but the expanded edition of the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, I want to tell you something. Uh, when Brother Jason asked me if I could stay and share with you, I thought, boy, I really need to talk to you about this, this important subject. We're living in such intense, pressured, terrible, challenging days, incredible pressures that are coming from every dimension, every part of our culture. This last year, we've experienced this pandemic of the COVID-19, and it seems that it's come across the, it's come into 2021. Our country's been devastated. The world has been devastated. And uh, with it in our country, adding to all that, the race riots, the BLM, the Antifa, the defunding of the police movement, a contentious presidential election, the canceled culture, and the woke culture. Somebody's going to have to tell me what the woke culture is. I'm not sure I connect. I, I told somebody the other day, I said, I, I'm just tired of it. I, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to go to Colorado and go to the mountains and rest for a while. <laughs> but anyhow, I tell you, we're living in incredible days. No wonder, with all of the things that's going on, the experts are telling us today that worry is the number one mental health problem among women. And it's among men, it's second only to alcohol, drugs, and suicide. Worry has been linked to uh, all the leading causes of, uh, of death, including heart disease and even lung disease and cancer and suicide. <laughs> of course, I'm reminded, I remember from the time I've been a little kid, I heard people say, you don't get ulcers from what you eat. You get ulcers from what's eating you. <laughs> I think that is right. Listen, Chuck Swindoll his comment about worry was interesting. He, Chuck Swindoll said, and I think you have it on the PowerPoint, he said, worry is anything that drains your tank of joy. Woo! Then he went on to say, it's something you can't change. It's something you're not responsible for. It's something you can't control. It's something or someone that frightens and torments and agitates you. It keeps you awake at night when you ought to be sleeping. That's worry, he says. I think he's right. I'll tell you what, I'm just glad to be able to announce to you this morning, in the face of the upheavals and the storms of life, the King of glory, he stands by our side. He's the master of the storm. He's the keeper of the, of the waves of the sea, and he's with us. Hallelujah. <laughs> glory to God. You know, I love that beautiful Dutch lady, Corey Ted Boone, who her and her family, of course, during the Nazi uh, terrible atrocities, Corey Ted Boone uh, and, and their family, of course, they were saving the lives of Jews in their house, the hiding place. And what an incredible testimony. And she had a, she traveled the world, of course, you know, after she came out of the concentration camp, and she had a, a little poem. It was a little couplet, and it was so, and I think she really hit right on target of what worry is. She said, worry is an old man with bended head carrying a load of feathers that he thinks are lead. <laughs> I thought, Corey, she's hit the nail on the head because worry is generally about what is not. It's what may be or could be, but it's not. Now, as we look at these 10 verses 
In Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 down through verse 34, Jesus is going to give us some practical instructions why that for a believer, for a child of God, worry should not be a part of our life. You might visit worry, but you don't set up housekeeping housekeeping and drag all the furnishings and everything that comes with it. Let's listen to Jesus. Let me just mention this before we read the passage. Do you know I counted the other day in chapter 6 of Matthew 12 times. How many times? 12 times Father is mentioned. Our Father which art in heaven. Hey, if he's your father, (laughs) that ought to be number one reason why you don't have to worry. Can I get an amen on that? Wow. So let's, let's, let's look at the scriptures. I have them on the PowerPoint. Now, the New King James Version, which I'm reading from, six times Jesus says, don't worry, don't worry. Don't. And then Jesus explains why you don't have to worry. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you four words, and I want you to write them down. Because really they give you the heart of this, of this whole teaching of Jesus. So grab a little piece of paper and a pen and jot these words down. Let's, let's read it together. Look, look with me, uh, beginning in verse 25. Therefore, oh, and incidentally, whenever you find the word therefore, find out what it's there for. It always connects with a preceding statement. And Jesus has just finished teaching about how we're to approach the Heavenly Father. And three times, we're going to read it, three times in this message about worry, Jesus says, therefore, or in view of, because of, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food? And the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubic to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, it's like wildflowers. Today is, and tomorrow they're thrown in the oven. Will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we wear? For after all of these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all of these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Wow. My life verse is verse 33. So simple, but oh, so profound. Look at the verse again. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things. Somebody say amen. Amen. All of these things are going to be added to you. You know, I think, in fact, we'll wind up on this verse. I think it's an ironclad secret that you, uh, of, of dealing with worry is you establish priorities in your life. He's number one. Some of us today have put God in the corner. We want him when we die because we want to make sure we don't go to the bad place. But he wants to be Lord of all. 
Yeah, now, don't shout me down because I'm preaching so good here today. I said he wants to be number one. <clears throat> Amen. You know, about 20, 25 years ago, Jeannie and I were driving in San Antonio and pulled up at a red light, pulled up behind a car, and it had the craziest bumper sticker. Now, I've seen, a few, uh, I've seen this a few times since, but back then, I thought, what? In, and it said this, keeping the main thing, the main thing is the main thing. I said, Jeannie, look at that. Who in the world would put that mumble-jumble double-speak on the bumper of their car? Keeping the main thing, the main thing is the main thing. Keeping the main thing, the main thing is the main thing. That car sat there, and I read that thing half a dozen times. I said, it's absolutely ridiculous. Keeping the main thing, the main thing is the main thing. <clears throat> well, as the car pulled away, the Holy Spirit whispered in my heart and said, what is the number one thing? What is the main thing? <clears throat> and I think that all of us need to answer that clearly before the Lord, that He is the main thing. And when He's the main thing, and we keep Him the main thing, everything else begins to fall into line. So <clears throat> uh, Webster's Dictionary, let me tell you, it, it's interesting. It says that worry means to be distressed or troubled, uneasy or upset, a feeling of being anxious, or, app, or apprehensive about what may happen. Our English word worry comes from an Anglo-Saxon word, comes from an Anglo-Saxon word, yeah, I'll <clears throat> have a little H, H2O, that actually has <clears throat> the meaning of to choke or to strangle. Uh, thank you, that's, uh, that's boy, that, that fit right, to choke or strangle, I needed that. <laughs> What happens is when you worry, you're choking your life out. You're strangling yourself. That's what the Anglo-Saxon word. Now, the Greek word for worry in the New Testament, the root word means to have a divided mind. It's to literally be drawn in different directions, to be pulled for thoughts that are legitimate and, and thoughts that are not legitimate. You're, you're literally pulled from one to the other. My goodness. I want to tell you. Jesus is not telling us here that you can't plan. Worry is, is he's not saying don't plan. I mean, Jesus planned. He planned for his ministry, the lives of his disciples, for his death, for his resurrection, his ascension. In fact, Jesus gave the instructions in another portion of Scripture where he said, if you go out and you're going to build a, a building, make sure you sit down, count the cost. He, he said, you, you've, got to, you, you've got to plan. So he's not saying not, not to plan. And he's not saying don't, don't have concern. Because there's times when we have certain concern about something. And I, I think immediately that if a parent has a small child playing down by the the edge of their property next to a street where traffic is going by, and that parent is not concerned to rush down and to get that child. <laughs> not a very good parent. So, but there's a big difference between concern and worry. Worry generally has to do with the future. <clears throat> it's basically something that you have no control over right now. Concern has to do with the present. And usually there's some things that you might be able to do in the present to take care of the problem. I, I have a friend, a minister, who told me about a woman that had passed away. For 40 years, she has lived practically a paranoia that she was getting cancer. Every cramp, every pain, she was always, pray for me, I'm I think I'm getting cancer. 40 years. Here a while back, she died. She's 73 years of age. She died of pneumonia. For 40 years, she spent her time worrying about the wrong disease. <laughs> Jesus gives us four reasons here of why we should not worry. Take the words down. Number one, worry is needless. Look at verse 25 again. Got it on the PowerPoint. Look at this verse. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, 
what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Here, Jesus is saying, look, worry is needless. Now, Jesus adds with this, he gives us two treasures that God has given us, two gifts. What are they? He tells you in the verse, life and your body. Huh. Now, doesn't it just make good sense that if he's the creator that gave us life and body, since he's the creator God, he's the sustainer God that will give us food to put in that body, clothing to put on that body, shelter to put over that body. So it's, Jesus is saying, it's needless, it's pointless. What in the world are you doing? In essence, Jesus is arguing from the greater to the lesser, meaning that greater than food and clothing and shelter is your life. That's the, your life and your body. And since, since God has created you, and he's given you life, and he's given you your body. It's absolutely needless. It's unreasonable that we go around worrying about whether God's going to take care of us. Hey, you were made a little lower than the angels. He created you in his image. You're the apple of his eye. He knows the hairs on your head. He counts them. He knows every number of them. And since he takes care of us, <clears throat> it's needless to go around worrying all the time. <clears throat> and then notice Jesus gives us two illustrations here. Did you see the two illustrations? It's the fowls and the flowers. <clears throat> you know, I must be screaming too loud at you people today. Look at verse 26. <clears throat> Look at the birds. They neither sow nor reap. <clears throat> they don't gather into barns, but your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Now, if you follow the logic of Jesus and his teaching, <clears throat> he's telling us, first of all, he argued from the greater to the lesser. Your body and your life is far more valuable than just the food you put in it and the clothes you put on it and the shelter you put over it. Now he argues from the lesser to the greater. What do I mean by that? He uses the fowls. He said, look, you remember in the other place when he teaches, he says, two sparrows are sold for a farthing. A farthing it was a fourth of a penny. And then the amazing thing, he says, and the heavenly father attends the funeral of every one of those sparrows. Here is a bird not worth even a penny, but the heavenly father attends the funeral. And Jesus says, don't you know? So he's arguing from the lesser to the greater. Look, if the Heavenly Father cares for birds. Now, I know it's cold in Colorado, but have any of you seen any of your birds in your backyard flying around with a nervous twitch? <laughs> Wondering if there are going to be enough worms to be able to survive the cold? No, for heaven's sakes. Wow. So the Heavenly Father, he's, he's saying, look, if God's going to watch over and take care of the, the less valuable, the, the, the birds, you're more valuable than they are. Mm. I remember the, <clears throat> the little poem, said the sparrow to the robin. You know, I'd really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Well, said the robin to the sparrow, I think that it must be they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. <laughs> I tell you, the birds could teach us something. God considers that we're much more valuable than, a, than, than birds. And then he draws your attention to the flowers. Look at verse 28 and 29. This is the second illustration that the Lord uses to underscore how needless and pointless it is for us to worry. Verse 28, so why do you worry about clothing? <clears throat> Consider the lilies 
of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So Jesus again is saying, look, it's needless, it's unreasonable. And, and he calls your attention, he said, take a look at nature. Look at the beautiful scenery and you people that live here in Denver, for heaven's sakes. Look at the gorgeous mountains, the absolute beauty of all that God has created. And, and, and you guys, you, you just get used to it. I'm telling you something. As we went up to Golden yesterday, brother, uh, brother Jason took us up. My ah, lands, take a breath of the fresh air and take a look at the creation of God. And the, he says, the Lord says, hey, take a look at nature. Look at what God has created, this beautiful world. <clears throat> and if he cares that much for wild flowers, he paints them. And he says, look, he said, Solomon, who had untold wealth at his disposal, <clears throat> and yet Solomon, in all of his glory and all of his wealth, was not arrayed like one of these millions of wildflowers that grow all over Denver. Well, I don't know if they're growing right now. They're waiting for March to come. <clears throat> but the argument that Jesus is making is that if God cares that much for the grass of the field, for the wild flowers that grow wildly, and he clothes them and paints every one of them, if he cares that much, and that they're here today and they're gone tomorrow, you're eternal. He gave his life on the cross. He redeemed you. You're his child. You're his son. You belong to the Most High God. You're the apple of his eye. How in heaven's name can you go around worrying? <clears throat> How many of you follow the argument of Jesus? It doesn't make any sense that God, who has taken such incredible care to paint the, the, the flowers of the field, and that somehow he would ignore us and leave us out. Hey, so Jesus, as he concludes it, he said, look, the birds, they neither sow nor reap nor build barns. Birds don't drive tractors, fill up the barn with all the grain. Every morning they go out, the Heavenly Father. And the flowers... They don't toil or spin. They don't go and sit down and use the sewing machine to make clothes. And if the Heavenly Father paints them in such beauty, here today, gone tomorrow, Jesus says it's needless for you to worry. Now, right quick. Listen, these, these other three, we'll, I'll, I'll wrap them up quick. Secondly, Jesus says it's senseless. Not only is it needless to worry, it's senseless. It's totally illogical. And here's what he says, verse 27, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubic to your stature? A cubic is 18 inches. So Jesus says, which of you can go and sit in a rocking chair? You know, worry is kind of like a rocking chair. There's a lot of action, but you're not going anywhere. There's no, no progress. It, it's certainly not going to move you to the future. All it does is worry makes you miserable in the present and it ruins your tomorrows. So 18 inches. I got thinking about 18 inches. My goodness. David Cook. Five foot six. Whew. That makes me seven feet tall. The first service I said, hey, all you nuggets, get out of the way. Here comes this seven foot spur. I'm going to dunk on, I'm going to dunk that ball. <laughs> You know, I'm wondering if maybe Jesus is saying, which of you can add to your stature? Maybe he's saying, which of you, by worrying, can add one day to your life? I think worrying can subtract from your life. You can literally worry yourself into an early grave. So Jesus is saying it's, it's absolutely senseless. It's, it's, it makes no sense of why anyone would worry. And thirdly, Jesus says, first of all, worry is needless. Second, worry is senseless. And thirdly, worry is useless. And look how he says it. 
Matthew chapter 6, verse 28 through verse 30. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And if God clothed the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow's thrown in the oven, will he not more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. In other words, when God goes out of his way, Jesus says to feed the birds and clothe the wildflowers. What in the world are you doing sitting around worrying? And since God takes care of the lower orders of creation, wildflowers, birds, God certainly will take care of the crown of his creation and his redeemed people. Who did you pick that up? That's what Jesus is driving at. I remember reading, it's been some time back, about J.C. Penney, who was a great Christian and started, of course, his chain of stores way back in the early part of the last century. It was in 1920, 1929 when they had the stock market crash, and his business was devastated. And J.C. Penney writes that he was, so, he was so filled with worry, he was literally miserable. In fact, he worried to such an extent that he lost rest and sleep, could not sleep at night. In fact, worried until he got shingles that I understand is one of the most painful experiences people can go through. He had shingles. He And he went into the hospital. They gave him tranquilizers to somehow try to settle him down. He still couldn't sleep. <clears throat> One night in bed, he, he literally said, I, I thought, I'll never see the, the light of another day. This is it. And he, he just literally was worrying himself to death, and his business would be destroyed. And suddenly, as he's laying there on his bed, he hears down the hall in the hospital, there was a chapel. And he hears coming from the chapel, there's some believers that have gathered in that chapel, and they're singing out the hymn, God will take care of you. I wrote down the verse. I love this, the, the, that beautiful hymn. No matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. Lean, weary one, upon his breast. God will take care of you. And then all of you remember the chorus. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will Take care of you, God will take care. Ooh. Come on, I think we ought to personalize that. Everybody sing it with me. God will take care of me through every day or all the way. He will Take care of me, God will take care. Well, okay. <laughs> Come on, look at your neighbor and sing that to him. God will take care of you through every day. For all the way, God will take care of you. God will take care of you. Can I get an amen today? <laughs> hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I tell you, I believe it today. I believe that God will take care of us. We're his children. Whew. Hey, let me tell you, back to J.C. Penney. He heard that song. He jumped out of bed, raced down the hall and into the chapel. 
He said when he stepped inside this chapel where these people were saying, God will take care of you, he writes, he said, a miracle took place in my soul. He said it's as if a bird was suddenly freed to fly out of the dungeon into the sunlight. He said, God visited me. And, and, and you know, I, it seems like I read that he, and I'm not positive of this, but that he gave 90% of all of the increase of the business he gave it to God. Oh, I'll tell you something. God will take care of us. Amen. Now, <clears throat> so Jesus teaches us worry is needless. Worry is senseless. Worry is useless. And notice, Jesus says worry is faithless. Listen to what he says in verse 31. <clears throat> Therefore, do not worry. Say, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Here it is, verse 32. For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. Jesus says it is absolutely faithless. When you let worry Begin to dominate your life. And let me just be honest with you. Every now and then, I've discovered as a believer, I might visit worry. But I don't live there. And I don't know, maybe you're like some people, that you, not just, you don't just visit worry, but worry moves in. And you set up housekeeping, and, and worry becomes your lifestyle. Oh, Lord, help us. Come on, everybody say, Lord, help us. So you know what Jesus says here? He says to worry is not Christian. He said you're acting like a Gentile. And Gentile in that world, in that word, it means a pagan. You're acting like a heathen. I've been in countries overseas. I remember being the first time Jeannie and I went to Japan. And I remember at the, before that one, one big Buddha that sets, what is it, about 50 feet? I forget what it is. Here's this big Buddha and these Japanese people lined up by the hundreds. And they're coming before this big Buddha and they've got their, their prayer request out on a piece of paper. And they throw their prayer request into this huge vat and they pick up a gong and they to wake up Buddha. So he'll read their prayer request. Gods that have no eyes. Gods that have no ears. Gods that can't feel the hurts. I asked one missionary, in fact, it was Archer Alderson, I said, why is it every time you see Buddha, he's always sitting, and he, and he, 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 looks, like, he looks like this. And Archie said, uh, he said, the missionaries, he said, their word for that is, uh, no, I can't help you, and give me your money. <laughs> I'll tell you what, religion extracts from people. Jesus came to give. He came to give. Oh, I want to tell you something. These are gods that can't see, gods that can't hear. And we go around and act like, I don't have a heavenly father in heaven. He don't know what I'm going through. Come on. Get real. Jesus is saying, when you worry, you're not acting like a Christian. You're not acting like a child of the king. Worry is atheism, atheism in action. It's acting as if there's no God, no heavenly Father. Now, the cure for worry is, as I told you, it's verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Jesus says, Estab and here it is. Here, you want the cure for wor worry? Establish priorities in your life. Make him number one. Not in the corner of your life somewhere as a fire escape when, when life is over so that he'll make sure you don't go to the bad place, that you get a free ride into heaven. No, no, no. No, you make him Lord over every area of your life. He's number one. Get your priorities in order. I want to ask you something. What's number one in your life? Who's number one in your life? He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In other words, to live a, a godly life. Let the Lord be Lord in your life. 
And he said, if you'll do this, all these things will be added to you. You know, it was, it was while we were involved in beautiful worship. This, boy, I'll tell you how I enjoyed the worship today. Thank you, Nathan and team. Absolutely beautiful. And I was standing there, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Listen, this is for all of us. And he said, I'm going to heal people today. I'm going to heal memories. I'm going to heal temperaments. And suddenly, like a flash, I haven't shared this testimony. In fact, I, I asked Brother Jason later if I shared this in Bible college. I, and, and Jeannie and I, I haven't mentioned this. It's been several years. But when Jeannie and I were first married and we launched into evangelistic ministry, uh, we were in Rockford, Illinois, and I asked the pastor, because I, at the days, I had not been able to hold any food down. I literally was spitting food up. I would stand up, go to the pulpit to preach, and I had to have uh, either hankies or Kleenex or something to spit food. It was embarrassing. It was nauseating. It was terrible. I literally need to go back before that, though, because when I was a child, there was five of us kids, and I heard from our relatives, and I heard all my life from my mom and dad, that I took after my mother's side of the family. Now, that wasn't a compliment, because they were all close to the insane asylum. <laughs> my mother had a terrible nervous breakdown in her early 30s. I was high strung. It, it, it troubled me in my schooling early years. Um, I had an uncle that committed suicide. Every one of them on that side of the family had major. Of course, they, my mother had been terribly abused and all of that on that side of the family. My grandfather was the last Indian agent uh, in Arizona at the, what, Montezuma Castles. It, and and uh, he, was, he was devilish. And, uh, oh, God help him. But anyhow, it, it tortured and affected the entire family. And I was told from the time I was a little boy, you're just like them. That year, yep, that's you. Graduated from Bible college, involved, called of God in the ministry in this terrible situation. I asked for a doctor. So I went to the doctor, and then they sent me to the hospital to have some, uh, you know, go through the... Uh, anybody ever had them where they, they give you that that, that, that uh, gr ground up concrete and you swallow that stuff and then they spin you around and turn you upside down, look at you inside and out and all this, this gravel and, and concrete. Anybody ever had that? Oh yeah, a few of you have had some of that stuff. So anyhow, I go back to the doctor a few days later. He's looking at the charts and he looks at me. He knows I'm in my early 20s. He said, what do you do for a living? What's your profession? I said, I'm a preacher. Oh, he said, that shouldn't do it. I thought, boy, a lot of he knows. But anyhow, he looked at me, and he said, young man, he said, I have never in all of my years practice seen anyone near your age with such a volcanic stomach. He said, your, your stomach is just, it's, it's literally so volcanic. He looked at me, he says, I'm going to give you a prescription. He said, you'll have to take this the rest of your life. He said, it'll put your stomach to sleep. You take it 30 minutes before where you'll be able to eat. And he said, you're going to have to change your professions. You'll never be able to know stress or any kind of anxiety. You'll have to find something that's totally... Incidentally, I'm looking for one of those jobs if anybody <laughs> has one. <laughs> I, I don't think there's such a thing, but anyhow... Uh, under my breath, I'm saying, Satan, you're a liar. God's called me to preach the gospel. He gave me the medicine. I remember even before we left Rockford, I was taking it, and uh, it, it would put your stomach to sleep. You could eat and digest a bit. The problem is it put me to sleep. I was standing in the pulpit preaching. I, I promise you, this is, and I was standing preaching, and I, I had to take my hanky and 
hide by yawn. I told Jeannie after the service, when the preacher puts himself to sleep in the pulpit, I said, things are in bad shape. So I said, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. And it was right after that. I took, I canceled things, and we started. My mother was living in Idaho. And we started from Rockford, Illinois, and coming, I think it's 80, coming across through Iowa and Nebraska, mile after mile. And I remember Jeannie had, was sleeping, and I was driving. I said, Lord, and I began to replay what I'd heard as a child. I said, Lord, I can't help my temperament. I can't. That's my personality. I've, I've inherited. I can't. I can't change me. <laughs> Boy, out in the middle of that, somewhere, I heard the Lord speak to me and said, I can change you. <laughs> Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We got to Idaho. I told my mom and mother had suffered from all of this stuff. I took every bit of it. I remember Jeannie and my mom walked into the bathroom while I put it all down the commode. God totally healed me of that. That's been, what, almost 50 years ago, baby. We've traveled around the world. I eat every kind of food. In fact, you can't get Mexican food too hot for me. I'm telling you. I, I've, I, God, God healed my temperament. Mm. Now, here's what applies to you. The Holy Spirit spoke to me this morning and said, I'm going to heal temperaments. I'm going to, hear, I'm going to heal psychological Areas where people, they've inherited certain things. There's been bruises and wounds and things that they've been dragging with them. I'm going to heal. I'm telling you something. Get ready. God's going to minister some healing in the lives of some people. Now, here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're closing right quick. I want all of us to make this declaration. We're going to put it up. And we're all going to make this declaration. And then we're going to open this for prayer. I want every person. Well, I'll get to that as soon as we give this declaration. Here it is. Come on, I want us all to stand. Let's stand. And I want you to make this from your heart. In fact, I wish that I had a, I should have made a copy of this and give it to all of you. Take it home and, and declare this all week long. Here it is. I'm too blessed to be stressed and too anointed to be disappointed. Come on, somebody say amen. I refuse to be discouraged to be sad or to cry. I refuse to be downhearted. Come on. And here's the, yeah, here's the reason why. I have a God who loves me. Woo! And I'm on his team. He is all wise and powerful and Jesus is his name. Though everything else is changeable, my God remains the same. I refuse to be beaten or defeated. My eyes are on my God. He has promised to be with me. And through this life I trod, I am looking past my circumstances. Y'all stand up with me? Come on. To heaven's throne above, my prayers have reached the heart of God, and I'm resting in his love. I give thanks to him and everything. My eyes are on his face. The battle is his. The victory is mine. He will help me win the race. I repeat, I'm too blessed to be stressed. Woo, somebody say amen in Jesus' name. Now, I want every person here that if there's an area in your temperament, the Holy Spirit has hit you with that. When I mention that, I know the, I know the Lord spoke to me this morning. God wants to heal some people. Maybe it was something somebody said to you. You know the wonderful testimony I've got to tell you? After God did this for me, I ministered deliverance to my mama. All my life I can remember my mother suffering from this because of terrible abuse. And I, I, I saw my mom freed. <laughs> oh, I want to tell you today, people, God wants to set you free. Oh, God wants to set you free. 
So maybe it's your temperament. Maybe it's some psychological things that kind of want to dominate your mind and dominate your life. There's, there's areas that you say, oh, I need healing in that. I'm not talking about your physical body right now. I'm talking about these areas of our personality and our temperament and what makes up the way we think and the way we respond, the way we act. It affects our parenting. It affects our spouse, our marriage, our children. It affects the world in which we... And you know it affects everything around you and it affects your Christian life and your testimony. And you say, oh, yes, Lord, I, I'm a candidate for freedom and victory and deliverance. I want you to step out of your seat and come and stand right here. We're going to believe God to touch you right now. Come on, come and stand right here quickly. Let me, let me just encourage you. I, I want you to hear me just for a moment so many times. And as they continue to, to minister, just continue to seek God. I just, for, for those of you who maybe didn't respond, there's so much shame that is connected to mental health. We, we, we're, we're happy to ask God to heal our bodies, but about our minds, many times we just, okay, it, it is what it is. It's just who I am. And I just want to pray a prayer of clarity and deliverance over your mind. So if you can, come on, let's just lift our hands right now. Just, just continue to lean in. Continue to ask God to bring deliverance to you. But Father, in the name of Jesus, God, for every lie that's been spoken over these precious people, either joining us online or in person, every lie that they have believed, every lie that was spoken over them that became their own identity, God, the narrative of someone else that they said, well, this is my narrative. God, I pray right now that you would just remove it in Jesus' name. God, I ask you that every area of their mind or their thoughts about how they see them and how they, how they process and who they are, God, would be rewritten by who you see them or how you see them or the strength in which you are giving to them. God, today, we surrender. God, today, we, maybe for the first time, we just say, Lord, I need you. I need you to touch my mind. I need you to bring clarity. I need you to, to touch my emotions. I need you to restore what's been broken and what's been, what's been sabotaged by, by pain of the past, by abuse, by fear. Lord, we come to you today as broken vessels asking you just to heal us. Humbling ourselves before you. Lord, I ask you right now that every lie every wrong thought, you would begin to dismantle that stronghold in Jesus' name. Just mantle, just dismantle the stronghold. If you can, just with me today, just lay your hands on your, on your own head. Just put your hands right on your own head by faith. I want you to say this after me. Say, I declare the freedom of Jesus Christ. I rebuke every lie. I am not what I think I am. I am who Jesus says I am. My mind is whole. I do not have the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. I have a sound mind. I just want you to just be in the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit ministers and he moves and he touches and he, just right now, just surrender these areas of your heart. Surrender them. Surrender them. Don't be, don't, don't be ashamed that you're human. You're human. Life has stained you. Sin has stained you. But you receive the goodness of God. Receive the goodness of God. Receive the wholeness of God. Lord, today we lay our lives at your feet. We lay our thoughts, our emotions, our temperaments. Lord, I ask you that you would heal us of the pain of the past. I ask you that you would restore to us what the enemy has stolen. Lord, I ask you that you would rewire patterns of thinking. The Lord, we were going to submit to your narrative, to your words. Lord, I ask you that you would just remove every stronghold 
that we would walk in freedom. And so, Lord, today we come underneath the authority of you. And there is no other name that is greater than the name of Jesus. So today we surrender our lives in the name of Jesus. We take a step forward in the name of Jesus. We acknowledge we have nothing within us that can get us where we want to go. It is only by you, Jesus. So today we receive your grace, we receive your mercy, and we receive your touch and your healing on our lives. And we love you. And we thank you today that through this text you said, Father, to us. You reminded us that we have a Father. And you see us. And you hear us. And you love us. You were not ashamed of the things in our lives that, are, that we're struggling with. You were extending your hand to help and to serve. So we say yes to you today. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Can we just give the Lord a hand today? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> you know, it's so important that we remember that the church of Jesus Christ is to be a place that we bring our broken humanness. This is not a place that you put your perfect face on. This is a place that you cry out to God. And you start the journey to let him touch you and transform you and heal you. And you put your faith and trust in him. And you continue to walk it out. I want you to know something. The father loves you. He cares so much for you. He cares so much for you. And you need to receive that love today. Amen. Come on, can we thank Pastor David for his ministry? Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd be honored if you could just let me bless you, if you just want to lift your hands to the Lord. Lord, we are committed to be people of the word. And so, Lord, today, I, as we've taken a step forward in a, out of obedience to the word, that you'd meet us right where we are. God, everybody is different, different contexts, different histories. But, Lord, what we do know is that you will take care of us. And so, Lord, today, I thank you for your fatherly care over our lives over our marriages, over our children, over our rebellious children, over our health, over our mind. Lord, we use wisdom. We, we are wise, but we look to you as our answer. So, Lord, I bless our people in Jesus' name. Strengthen them. Give them peace. Protect them. Such angels around them. Minister to them even as they go from here. Lord, I ask you that you would protect the work that you've done in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you.